When we are fighting together, that's better for us. If we really want to fight against them, we free Afghanistan. Not only Kandahar, all Afghanistan. Across the dusty plains, mountains rise abruptly, a protective circle around the city of Kandahar. And here we found the first Soviet and Afghan army outposts, like islands in a sea of Mujahideen. Tanks at ground level, lookouts high above the road, and the remains of a large Soviet fuel convoy ambushed some time ago. The Mujahideen now move round and brush up against these defences all the time. And it was across the road, just 100 metres from this Soviet position, that the Mujahideen slip over to gain access to the city itself. Immediately, the extent of their hold on this area, only four kilometres from the city, became clear. Out of sight of the ever-watchful Soviet troops, they milled around, armed to the teeth, with weapons which still come across the border from neighbouring and friendly Pakistan. But in the three kilometres or so between here and the city, we came across the scene of many a last-ditch stand by the Soviets and Afghan troops. This is the litter of war, left as they were pushed back in bitter close-quarter fighting over the past few years. We walked into the Kandahar suburbs with Ismail Gailani, a senior leader in NIFA, the National Islamic Front for Afghanistan, one of the seven Mujahideen groups fighting the Soviets. He'd come on the long journey to meet military commanders from these other groups to try and persuade them to settle their differences in the fight against a common enemy. With him was Haji Latif, the legendary Lion of Kandahar, still in the thick of it all at the age of 76. The leaders range from those with a firebrand Muslim idealism to those with a more worldly, wise, pragmatic outlook, from those who want to kill as many Soviet troops as possible to those who feel they should be given the chance to withdraw in safety. He harangued the meeting at length, gunfire all round, emphasising the need for unity, but it's doubtful if the outcome was really as optimistic as Ismail Gailani suggested. That meetings, they can agree with me. All of them say, yes, you are right. We haven't got anybody before to tell us the same things. Now you told us, now we know when we are fighting together, that's better for us. Do you think you're going to be able to take this place? If we really want to fight against them, we free Afghanistan. Not only Kandahar, all Afghanistan. <laughs> Between prayers, the weapons are brought out. Here, a 72mm recoilless rifle made in China. Another Chinese weapon, a copy of a Soviet 82mm gun. These are the weapons they've used to push both the Soviets and the Afghan army back into the strongly defended positions in the major cities. This then is Kandahar, or at least the old town. Thousands of people used to live here before the Russians came nine years ago to smash it all with aerial and artillery bombardments. Now, only the Mujahideen live here and fight, pinning their enemy down around the huge mosque which stands on the southern edge of the city. The Soviets, who were in the process of withdrawing their troops from Kandahar, have reversed that process. Reinforcements have been sent to bolster the defences as the Mujahideen tighten their grip. It's a sort of stalemate. The Soviets are disinclined to take the fight to the Mujahideen, who in turn seem content to keep up a steady harassment rather than an all-out attack. It's later on that leaders like Haji Latif hope to take the city from a demoralised government force once the Soviets have withdrawn completely. Meanwhile, another group was in the middle of negotiations to exchange prisoners. They'd taken a Soviet trooper, a young man who looked distinctly worried as well he might, forced into a seemingly friendly gesture with his captors, men not well known for friendly gestures. And indeed, we heard later, he was exchanged for seven Mujahideen. So it was then, once again, time for another round of annoying the enemy. Across a wide stretch of country along the south and the east of the city, weapons were made ready. A multi-barreled rocket launcher, an impressively noisy weapon when fired, but not very effective against strongly fortified positions. An anti-aircraft gun, the crew showing a distinct, but unfortunately very common, lack of finesse in their fire drill. An incoming round landed on an approach route often used by them. Battle was joined. Some reinforcements moved along the road, but the Mujahideen failed to take advantage of this tempting target. 
The enemy was also engaged at much closer quarters amongst the ruins of the town. For the wounded, the future is pretty bleak. There's not much in the way of medical backup. Casualties can and do mount quickly on either side, and while weapons and men continue to replace those lost, what will count in the end is the will to win. That's one quality the Mujahideen do have, however disorganized they may be, or at odds amongst themselves. The Soviets have yet to lose an important population center, but if this city does fall under Mujahideen pressure, it will allow them to form a provisional government here, one which could be recognized by the Western powers, an important step along the road to replacing Kabul's communist regime with an Islamic government. Desmond Hamel, ITN, Kandahar.